Uh, hi everyone and welcome to our taster lecture uh, from wherever you are, however early or late it may be. So as Laura said, I'm Mike Jennings and I'm based in the Department of Development Studies, one of the global top five departments for the study of global development and humanitarianism. So what I'm going to do this evening is just to give a, a taster lecture, which is a short example of how we discuss issues and topics in our programme. So I'll speak for 25, 30 minutes and then leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, humanitarian aid, the support that we give to people in need in the midst of crisis. Now, of course, when we're confronted with suffering, it's a natural instinct to want to respond in any way we can and doing nothing uh, many feel is simply unacceptable. When asked about the humanitarian response during the Ethiopian famine in the mid 1980s, Bob Geldof defends um, it on the principle that if even one life was saved, or if only one life was saved, it would still be worth it to save that life. But the issue is that responding to complex emergencies and crises, particularly those that are focused around conflict, um, is difficult. You know, how can humanitarian actors ensure that they're given access to all sides, no matter where, you know, where the suffering is, no matter which side they happen to be on? How can they ensure that the aid they give is only going to be used by those in need and not by the military, by the government, by other forces and other actors? And how, of course, can humanitarian workers be protected from violence in extremely violent contexts? But there's another question that I think gets asked a lot less. And that's whether humanitarian organizations, despite their best intentions, are actually causing harm during their interventions as a result of the way that they're operating. So I suppose to come back to the point that's often made by Bob Geldof, if one life was saved, but at the cost of many lives, does that still remain acceptable? So what I want to do in this lecture uh, let me be clear, is not to suggest that humanitarian activity inevitably cause, causes harm, is always problematic and shouldn't take place. What I want to do is to challenge some of the assumptions that it is always and inherently good, that it is always good to go in and no matter what is done, provided one life is saved, that makes the whole effort, the whole endeavour um, worthwhile. Now, because getting access to people in the midst of conflict or crisis is so difficult, um, a set of core humanitarian principles has um, emerged over the past 150 years or so since the creation of the Red Cross to ensure that humanitarian actors can reach those in need of assistance and do so without being blocked or attacked and so on. And so these core principles are firstly humanity, the idea that human suffering must be addressed wherever it is, no matter which side um, uh, people happen to be on. Um, uh, and it's based on the principle of need, whoever needs it should receive it. it. Should be based on impartiality, the second core principle, that it shouldn't be given according to any criteria based on nationality, race, gender, religious belief, class, or political opinions, purely on need. Neutrality. Humanitarian actors must not take sides and critically must not be perceived, must not be believed to take sides by those actors engaged in the crisis or in the conflict. Uh, and there are, neither can the aid support intentionally or otherwise one side or another. And finally, independence. For humanitarian organisations, it's absolutely critical that they're seen to operate autonomously, that they're not linked to any political, economic or military actor um, engaged in that conflict or who has an interest in that conflict. Now, of course, no one suggests that these principles are easy in practice and they've led to some critical failures. Uh, quite famously, during the Second World War, the Red Cross has been criticized for and actually has apologized for failing to report and tell the world about what was going on in the concentration camps. And both the Red Cross and Médecins Sans Frontières and other humanitarians have been criticized for failing during the Rwandan genocide in 1994 uh, to call it what it was, a genocide, but rather presenting it as a conflict between two sides, apportioning no blame to the government, which was responsible for almost the entirety of the violence. 
But despite some of the problems and the acknowledged problems within the humanitarian sector, they are seen as essential for building trust and for gaining access. So it's critical um, that humanitarian agencies are seen to adhere to these principles if they're to operate in conflict zones. So um, various sides will let them in, will understand what their job is and will give them access to those people who need um, assistance. And of course, it can help protect the humanitarian organizations and their workers, their staff, uh, and the facilities that they run, the clinics, the hospitals, the feeding stations, and so on, from attack, because they're seen as being impartial, catering to all, no matter what side they're on. Now, what I want to do is to suggest not that these are poor or bad or always have bad outcomes, but to suggest that actually engaging in emergencies, because it is so deeply political, because it is so... Um, difficult, sometimes harm can be caused even when humanitarian actors are adhering to the principles. And some might argue that actually a blind adherence to the principles can make sometimes, can sometimes make this harm even worse. So to return to the Ethiopian example that I briefly mentioned at the start, uh, for many people of my generation in particular, the response to the Ethiopian famine of, of 1984-5 was a moment of, of great global um, awakening. Uh, it was inspired by a series of news reports by the journalist Michael Burke and the, camera the cameraman Mohamed Amin, uh, which described what was happening uh, as a biblical famine caused by a catastrophic uh, collapse in food production. Um, the Live Aid concerts that followed just those concerts alone raised $127 million, which is about $400 million in today's money, which at the time was one of the largest amounts ever raised um, by a single appeal across 24 hours. And humanitarian actors, NGOs, uh, and other organizations flooded into the country to provide relief. But the problem was that this wasn't a famine that was caused by food shortage. This was a famine that was caused by a government prosecuting a war against um, uh, people in the north of the country uh, and using famine, using the destruction of food sources deliberately to undermine the rebellion and to reassert its own authority. So what then was the consequence of the mass humanitarian effort to bring food aid into the country, which undoubtedly did save lives? No one is denying that many, many lives were saved by the actions of those humanitarian agencies. But it's also true that because food was being brought into the country, the government was able to direct some of it, uh, some of its spending that it otherwise would have had to spend on food, towards the military. So it allowed it to reestablish the strength of its military in prosecuting the war. The government also diverted some of the stocks, uh, the food stocks to supply its own soldiers. So in a very real sense, the food aid, the other humanitarian assistance was allowing the government to continue to prosecute a war that it was in the process of losing. And perhaps most egregiously, Humanitarian actors supported through their aid a government implemented resettlement policy that was ostensibly about taking people from uh, the famine ridden north and moving them to more productive areas, but was actually a government policy that was deliberately designed to take people who might support the rebel forces and move them elsewhere. In other words, to undermine uh, the, the ability of the other sides to create war uh, or to prosecute that war. Um, so clearly, regardless of the intentions, it, they weren't impartial, they weren't neutral. In effect, they were taking a side, not that they wanted to, but that was the outcome of the way that the humanitarian aid was delivered. Now, were the humanitarian actors aware of this? Well, if they weren't, shouldn't they be? Uh, surely being neutral means actively making sure that you're being so. Um, just saying you're not, uh, favoring a side, if your actual practice does so, is surely not within the spirit of the principles. But if they were aware, and actually we know that many NGOs and humanitarian actors were aware of what was going on, was it ethical to present the famine in the ways that they did on news reports, in the appeals for donations? And how could they justify participating in a resettlement campaign that itself led to a considerable number of deaths? And of course, this is not something that is particular to one crisis. 
the challenge for humanitarian action is that bringing any resource into a conflict uh, setting makes that resource part of the crisis economy. And these can sustain the crisis by allowing sides to keep fighting, and it can create new crises by encouraging new conflicts over the control of those new resources. In Somalia, for example, it, when food aid was brought in in 1993, much of it was distributed through the warlords that were fighting amongst themselves at that time. Now, humanitarian organizations argued, perhaps understandably, perhaps correctly, that this was the only realistic way of getting food to those in need. But the consequence was still that it reinforced the power and authority of the warlords over the communities in which they were based, and then doing so perpetuated the conflict. In Syria too, one of the most challenging uh, and dangerous um, of emergencies that we've had in modern times, um, we can also see how humanitarian food aid has been used by all sides. So the government has insisted that food aid within its own controlled areas have been channeled through government controlled organizations. And that allows it to be seen to be fulfilling its welfare obligations, to be seen to be acting the way that states should be uh, in providing uh, food for its citizens, undermining opposition, um, and also allowing it to spend, divert resources to its military. And the government, in, in limiting access to rebel held areas, to opposition held areas, the government has also um, led to those oppositions being undermined to have protests uh, and demonstrations against them because of the hunger that's growing in some of those areas. And supplies have been diverted from civilians to the military on all side. The Islamic State, for example, demanded that it supervised uh, all relief activities. And more than that, it actually demanded that one third of food aid would be distributed in boxes that had the uh, ISIS, uh, the Islamic State logo on it, in order that they could take credit rather than humanitarian actors. So I think there's a real question to be asked about the balance between the potential for albeit unintended harm caused by humanitarian organizations against the assistance that they can actually provide. And then there's also the question about whether humanitarian organizations are asking this question sufficiently robustly and transparently. Let's look at another example. So in July 1994, uh, the Rwandan Patriotic Front defeated the genocidal government uh, of Rwanda. And as the RPF swept towards Kigali, around 2 million people, mostly Hutus, uh, fled the country, fearing rep reprisals for the genocide, even though the RPF uh, had issued many public declarations that it wouldn't seek uh, to take revenge. And within the space of about four days, over 850,000 people descended on a small town in uh, then Zaire, now uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, a town called Goma. And it led to one of the largest humanitarian responses up till that point. So around 150 to 200 organizations swept in to provide relief. Around $1.5 billion was spent on operations over the course of the year. And just to put that in context, very little was actually spent in Rwanda by humanitarian organizations on the people who had suffered genocide. Um, all of this was going uh, to these camps outside, and I'll explain why that's problematic in a minute. And it also received a huge amount of interest from the media, led to campaigns by humanitarian organisations asking for donations, and a clear link made in those campaigns, a fraudulent link as it happens, uh, that those who had suffered genocide were now suffering as refugees. And the reason that is fraudulent is because these people were not those who had suffered from the genocide or those being the targets and the victims of genocide. Some of those in the camps, possibly many, had been active participants in the genocide. The camps were dominated by the Hutu militia who had led the genocide. And critics suggest that the resources that were brought into the camp and the fact that humanitarian organizations worked through the Hutu militias in order to maintain control, in order to distribute those resources to those in need, allowed those militias to assert control over people, sometimes brutally, to reassert their authority and even to rearm. Guns and other weapons were being shipped in under the cover of humanitarian aid. Of course, nothing to do with the humanitarian agencies, but nevertheless, the vast influx of resources did provide cover to allow themselves to rearm. And of course, that contributed to the long lasting instability and conflict in that region that has led to the deaths of what? 
certainly more than three, possibly probably more than five million people uh, over the past um, uh, couple of decades. Um, so this was deeply worrying. And this isn't just an external analysis. People recognized this at the time. So Kevin Watkins, who was working for Oxfam, reporting on what Oxfam was doing and thinking about reflecting on their activity, um, talked about the fact that they were delivering aid through the people who had committed the genocide in Rwanda, uh, calling this you know, a grave abuse of international assistance. The then president of Médecins Sans Frontières, Roni Broman, goes further. The humanitarian intervention, he says, far from representing a bulwark against evil, was in fact one of its appendages. That's an incredibly strong statement to write. But the response has been seen as an instance where the humanitarian community got it badly wrong and got their priorities badly wrong in where aid was being delivered, where it wasn't, and the ways in which it was being delivered. And some have argued that actually one of the problems is that human, you know, humanitarian organizations survive on donations. They need income in order to carry on existing. And these emergencies can often be used if they're presented in the right way to boost their profile and therefore to boost their funds. Um, so Mills, for example, talks about the fact that they're the perfect opportunity to raise funds for the immediate emergency, but also long term funds that keep them going. Um, Terry you know, talks about how Rwanda provided a, a show of suffering in which the enemy was the virus and the savior was humanitarian aid. And the question we have to ask ourselves, is this just a particularly a unique example of extremely poor behavior? extremely bad practice or can we see elements of this perhaps not to the same extent but nevertheless uh, similar outcomes and similar processes in other emergencies and many would argue that we can and humanitarian responses can also cause harm through the way that they're implemented so the response to the Haiti earthquake in 2010 was you know another of those watershed moments the largest one uh, humanitarian response um, up until that point. Five billion dollars was spent uh, in the first few months alone and vastly more over the next 18 months. But it was also seen and it's been you know uh, evaluated and is used within the humanitarian sector as an example where things went wrong, where the response actually not only didn't necessarily do as much good as it should have done, but perhaps in some cases actively caused harm. Um, and this was due to simple, simply poor practice in many cases. So communication between the various organizations was incredibly weak. There was very little coordination, which led to replication of efforts, um, lots of organizations working in some areas, leaving other areas uh, devoid of any response uh, and uh, under supply of, of resources in some areas because people simply weren't talking about what they were doing and where they were doing. There was weak engagement with local communities. The major meetings between the major humanitarian donors were all held in English. How do you justify that in a French speaking country? Of course, that excludes um, local population. And those, these are the populations that are gonna have to rebuild, reconstruct. They need to be front and center at any, of any humanitarian response. Many of the incoming humanitarian organizations had become, because like everyone, they were incredibly moved and wanted to act and respond to the suffering they saw on television. But that didn't mean they actually had the skills <clears throat> or the resources, and many didn't have the skills or the resources or their experience for dealing with uh, an emergency on this scale. Some organizations didn't even come with enough resources to provide for their own food and their own housing, which meant that some of the incoming aid that was meant to go to those people who had just been through this terrible earthquake had to be diverted to support the humanitarian actors. Again, that's, that seems to me to be fairly dreadful in terms of practice. But perhaps even worse, particularly from a health perspective, volunteers can come in as they can in many of these vulnerable contexts and work without necessarily needing to prove or demonstrate they have the credentials to do so. And whilst this might not matter for some functions, if we're talking about medical practice, if we're talking about people practicing medicine and health um, interventions who don't, aren't necessarily qualified to do so, that would be completely illegal in any global North country. So why would we suddenly find it acceptable just because we're talking about the midst of an emergency? Um, and again, we might say that the example of Haiti is particularly egregious, but it certainly isn't unique. 
These aspects are common across many humanitarian responses. And the consequences for vulnerable people can be both catastrophic and also incredibly disempowering. People don't lose their rights. People don't lose the right to um, uh, good treatment, to effective responses simply because they're suffering through an emergency. But in those contexts, it's all too easy for the humanitarian organizations to use their power to control everything and to exclude local organizations, local individuals and local communities from their decision making. And I think this speaks to the final thing that I want to talk about in relation to humanitarian actors, which is the issue of power and debates around decolonization in humanitarianism and the extent to which humanitarian principles are perhaps being used not by all organizations, not by all individuals, uh, and certainly perhaps not deliberately, but nevertheless, are they being used to exclude others and to defend the power of humanitarian actors? Do we need to focus more on the, do we need, to, when we focus on the intentions and the values of humanitarian organizations and say, well, I like them because they reflect the values and intentions that I have, are we in doing so ignoring the experiences of the affected populations? What value are we placing on the experience that they have of working with these humanitarian organizations? And critically, how are humanitarian organizations held accountable for their actions? And um, let's be clear, there are many who see problems within the humanitarian sector who see problems of racism and coloniality within the formal humanitarian sector. And many of you will know that last year, around a thousand staff within MSF accused their own organization of being institutionally racist. Um, calling on the organization, the leadership of the organization to take action, to engage with ideas and issues around power and decolonization and racism in order to make responses better. So under the cover of the need to respond to suffering and the sense that we in the global north must be the ones to do it, is humanitarian embedded in a kind of a white saviorism complex? Uh, and does that enable approach, approaches which are perhaps racist, perhaps disempowering, and perhaps create new pathways of vulnerability? Not always, not inevitably, but in enough occasions at enough times to mean that this isn't just a one-off and needs to be taken seriously. So look, it's hard, perhaps impossible to look at the world, uh, look at suffering in the world and not to want to respond. And I'm absolutely not saying that we shouldn't respond. What I am saying is that we can't assume that just because humanitarian organizations have good and honorable intentions, that this means they're not causing harm. And we can't excuse harm that those actors cause on the basis of their good intentions. We don't accept a defense of good intentions when we're talking about serious harm that has been committed by for-profit companies or by governments. So the fact that we may admire the values of workers for humanitarian organizations, their dedication, is that good enough? Doesn't that prioritize our feelings, our privilege, our experiences over the lives and experiences of those who are in the midst of great vulnerability and have suffered additional harm? So how can the humanitarian principles be used in ways that lessen vulnerability, empower communities and live up to their aspirations? It isn't about saying humanitarian is bad or should be abandoned, um, but about how it can be structured in new ways, in fairer ways, in much more equitable ways that preserve the human dignity of all and protect against additional harm. So uh, this is really what we're thinking about when we're talking about these issues in development study and all issues, no matter what the topic happens to be. It's about challenging and questioning assumptions trying to look beneath the surface to see if we can uncover perhaps the reality of what's going on and to try and take a look not from the perspective of top-down organizations and what organizations and policymakers think is happening, think they're doing, but actually how it's experienced by people on the ground and how that experience can help us improve, can help us create the good change that of course we all want to see. So look, I'm just, I'll leave this up. Um, you may want to take some of those, um, but uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open this up to questions. So you can either ask me questions about the things that I've been specifically talking about, or of course you can ask me questions um, about the program. Um, and so if you can put them into the uh, Q&A box, 
um, then uh, I'll be able to answer them. I'm just going to go through them in order. I apologize if you put in a question and I don't get to you, um, but at, towards the end, I'll put in my email address and I'm always very happy to carry on with these conversations afterwards. Um, so uh, Amana, and I'll apologize in advance for any mispronunciations of, a names, um, of names. So Amana has asked uh, if I could talk about career assistance uh, for students, especially for international students. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, all of our students are wanting, or most of our students are wanting to work in the global development or humanitarian sector. Um, now, I don't know what your experiences of careers offices are in your institutions of your first degree, in my first degree institution they were kind of fairly standard they assumed everyone was going to go into you know work for accountancy firms or marketing firms and they didn't really they weren't very imaginative we're really lucky that at SOAS we have a really creative um, interesting careers office that gets our students and knows exactly what they want to do and with the department we put on a lot of um of, uh, collaborative events and we work closely with careers in order to provide advice and skills and opportunities for networking uh, for our students. Networking is probably one of the most important things you can do whilst you're a student uh, and the careers office and the department and jointly we put on networking events. Uh, we also make use of our alumni for example and bring them in so they can talk about their experiences of how they transitioned from studies to a job. Uh, the careers office also have information about internships and volunteering um, opportunities as well as running fairs with potential employers, uh, bringing students and those employers together uh, and offering lots of advice on um, you know, how you can sell yourself, how you can uh, um, approach organizations organizations and of course they are under, they understand that most of our students or a very large proportion of our students are international so they're oriented towards meeting the needs of our students many of whom wherever they come from are going to be wanting to work and end up working in countries other than their home countries so there's plenty of support on careers you can actually have a look at our website we have more information about careers and transitioning to careers on our website um, Instituto says that in regards to Haiti, uh, I'd highlight a number of reported abuses um, committed by uh, minister agents. Yeah, look, there was an awful lot that was going on um, uh, by you know many different actors there, and I'm certainly not su suggesting that humanitarian actors were uniquely poor in their practice. Um, although I think that um, there is a, a significant gap perhaps sometimes between the proclaimed um, uh, values and, and, and ways of working that humanitarian actors suggest that they have and the actual realities. You know, for those who've been in the UK or in the UK a few years ago, when we heard about some of the things that happened with Oxfam, a leading NGO in Haiti, particularly around the use of sex workers and engagement with sex workers, the real surprise for those who work in humanitarianism was that this was, you know, one of the first times that such things had become public, uh, not that they were going on. That was no real surprise to anyone. Um, but certainly, you know, a crisis and emergency context um, because of the huge power differentials means that all kinds of abuse are going on by all kinds of different actors. They're incredibly difficult environments, of course, to work in. Um, OK, so someone is asking uh, for the research of international development program. How many students will SOAS take for this year? <clears throat> and can you take the, um, yeah, so we don't really have a set number um, of how many students we have. Um, the research in international development is not exclusively, but often used by those who want to go on and do a PhD. So the numbers actually vary quite considerably. Um, so it kind of averages somewhere between 15 and 20 students, but sometimes it's a bit more, sometimes it's a bit less. Um, you know, if you meet the criteria for it, we will make you an offer. Um, so that is the criteria. We don't kind of have a, a cutoff number whereby we say we're not going to accept any more people on this program. And we have a pretty good idea of, 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 of how many people are going to want to do each program each year within a band. So if you're worried that you might not be accepted, uh, please don't. Um, if you've met our criteria, you will be made an offer. Um, OK, just going through. Uh, I'm going to come back to your next one, Instituto, just because I'm going to give other people a chance to speak. But hopefully I'll come back to that one if we have time. Um, 
Okay, so Charlotte is asking a good question about when module enrollment happens for programmes starting in September. Laura may be able to answer this better than me. I think it starts happening over summer. Is that right, Laura? Yes, that's right. So the registry will get in touch with you over the summer um, to let you know the exact sort of timetable for your enrolment. Um, but generally, module enrolment will happen as part of your overall enrolment process just towards the end of September. And I should say that, you know, you can find details of all of our modules online. So if you go to the program that you're taking and you or you will be taking and you click on the structure, then uh, if you can see all of the modules and each of those has a link. So you'll be able to um, click on that link and it will give you um, a brief outline of um, what what is looked at in that particular module. And if you're not sure about what module to take, just get in touch with that module convener, the person who, who runs that module. Their name will be on it, their email will be there, and you can just ask them for more details to see if it's the kind of thing that you want to take. There is also an op, you know, when you get to SOAS, once you've enrolled, there is, you know, you, you'll have about a week if you want to change your mind uh, and change to another module, you have about a week to be able to do that. So I would always recommend that you do sign up over summer, um, but there is an opportunity. The, the only uh, limitation on that is if, if it's a, in a classroom where there are limited numbers then there may need to be limits put on it um, but any questions about modules you may have just get in touch and someone will be able to tell you about their module uh, George has asked about um, examples of things that you may deal with in your job after development studies this is absolutely impossible to answer I'm afraid because our students go on to do such amazingly diverse things so most are going on to work in the global development or humanitarian sector in a whole different range of functions. You can see on our website the type of jobs that um, our students go on to do. And what I would want to emphasize is that um, our students come to us because they want to make a, a good difference in the world. They want to create social change. And what our programs can do is to help you find that place where you can make the change you want to in the area that you want to, in the way that you want to, and know what it is you're doing and know and be able to understand what the likely outcome of the things that you're doing are. Um, so we don't, there isn't a kind of a, you know, these are the kind of things you'll be doing other than most of our students will be working in the global development or humanitarian sector. So it's the kind of roles you would expect there, be it for international organizations like the UN or national donors um, or NGOs and other charities and so on. Um, and you'll see if you look at the website, actually, you know, not all of our students go into global development. Some go into journalism or government, even to kind of private sector and banking. Um, so it's it's about the skills that our, our programs provide. And one of those core skills, I think, is cultural intelligence. You know, one of the, and this links back to the SOAS idea that we look at things through a contextual lens. It's really, it's going to become increasingly important for employers, I think, that people understand that you can't simply replicate the same idea, the same policy, the same approach in country after country or region after region, that you need to understand the context in which you're engaging. Um, so for anyone, whatever sector you're working in, whether it's global development, humanitarianism or anything else, having that deep contextual cultural intelligence is going to be really important. Those are some of the strongest skills uh, that our, our, our students develop whilst they're here. Um, okay, there's a question about uh, scholarship opportunities. Go to the um, scholarship webpage on the website that outlines all of the scholarships that are available to you. Um, do so as soon as you can, because some have deadlines that will be coming up. Um, it's also worth checking back, um, because if, if any new scholarship opportunity comes in, whether internal to SOAS or external that we found out about, um, it will be advertised on that page. So if you go to the SOAS website, type scholarships in the search box, it should take you to the section and that will give you all the information we have. We do have SOAS scholarships. Um, so, you know, do apply for them, have a look, check out the deadline and make sure that you do apply. Um, Ariana's asked a question about uh, the practical skills and experience. Um, so I, I've answered that in part, I guess, about the cultural intelligence, the contextual knowledge. You know, we do also, um, uh, you know, have modules that engage with more practical tools and skills in relation to development and humanitarianism. But really the key skills, what are what employers are most interested in, as well as the cultural intelligence, is your analytical ability. I mean, you can teach someone how to do a particular technique, 
how to develop, how to write a project proposal, for example. But it's much harder to teach people how to analyze it, how to think critically about it, how to know which questions you need to ask in order to make sure that it works. And it's that critical ability that is so important. And that, I guess, for me, from what our employees tell us, uh, it would be one of the core skills um, that, that you get from this. So, of course, there are the practical elements. There's the, the, the deep knowledge about uh, development theory, development practice and development policy and an understanding of what development is, what it could be, what it should be and so on. Um, but it's that critical analytical ability that marks you out as someone who is a thinking practitioner rather than someone who just does what they're told or does what everyone else does because that's the way that it's always been done. Uh, okay, so um, Mariana, uh, I'm, I'm deliberately <laughs> not mentioning uh, complimentary compliments, but uh, you know, uh, comments. But you know, thanks for them. I, I do appreciate them. Um, but I, you know, I don't want to sound big-headed. But um, so thanks for the comment. But um, you're asking about can you discuss case studies from your own background? along lectures absolutely probably about half of our students are coming with some kind of experience uh, working in the sector and many others will have experiences just drawn from day-to-day -day life uh, in across a whole range of different countries the reason that our tutorial discussions work really well is because students bring those experiences and of course you can refer to them in your work if you have particular interests you can follow those up in the further reading that you do around the particular topics so yeah we we actively encourage what we want students to do is to bring those experiences to talk about them particularly when they contradict something that the lecturer said or something that you've read in the literature because that's really nice to have some well okay the, the the literature the academic literature says this but in my experience this is what happens and that's where you get really dynamic interesting conversations that advance everyone's learning and, and what makes it so satisfying for us as lecturers to, to teach these modules because we're also learning through our interactions with you and with our other students um okay uh Right, so someone has asked if I'd recommend this programme for someone who's already studied international development. You know, I, I think there's an extent to which you'll have to look at the structure and see whether you think that this is repeating the things that you have already studied. I think the only thing that I can say is that we do have quite a lot of students on our programme who have studied international development at undergraduate level and still come on to do a master's. Um, and it's not necessarily that unusual if you think about it you know someone who's done a politics degree may well go on to do a master's in politics you know the expectation is that when you get to master's level you're doing it at a deeper level you're perhaps engaging in different sets of learning through options um, uh, and so on but but do take a look at the detail of the structure and if it isn't sufficient if it doesn't really answer your question get in touch with the program convener and perhaps talk about it with them uh, and that should give you a clearer idea um okay so andrea is asking about alternative institutional frameworks for humanitarian aid and are there any projects i can point to now perhaps not necessarily projects but i think there are an awful lot of debates that are going on um the person i would actually re I recommend is um, mark dubois so that's um m-a-r-c uh, first name second name d-u-b-o-i-s uh, so he's actually attacked, he's, 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 he's linked to our department, but he's, he's writing some really interesting things. He's former president of MSF, uh, but writing some really interesting things about um, power, uh, coloniality, racism within um, humanitarianism. Um, if you've worked in the sector, you will be aware of things like the Sphere Project, which is an attempt to increase accountability of humanitarian organizations uh, and ensure that they they better meet both the human rights and the actual needs of those suffering so that's quite an interesting um, uh, thing to look at a set of standards to look at and also read some of the debates about that um, we can always provide anyone with all kinds of different readings so if you're interested in reading in a particular area look up on the website see which member of staff works on that area uh, get, or you can just email me and I'll pass it on uh, and we can always try and think of interesting things for you to look at. So get in touch for that. In fact, while I'm here, I'm just going to, in, in the chat box, because uh, I know some of you may have to go, I've put my email in there as well. 
Um, but anyway, I'll try and carry on uh, answering as many questions as I can. Um, right, sorry, because it keeps moving, as, as uh, I'm just trying to get where I am now. Uh, okay, so someone is asking about uh, an extra language. Uh, can you take a language as well as the MSc? So uh, yes, actually we can. Um, we have what's called an open option. And what that means is that as, in addition to the core, so that the development studies modules that you need to take as part of your degree, you can take one um, option outside of our department. And that can be in whatever you want, provided it's it's open, opened by the other departments. So many people use that for a language. Some people use that uh, to look at a particular country or a particular region, their history or their politics. Uh, some people do things like music or art. So that really allows you to shape your degree and gain additional knowledge uh, as you want to. And certainly learning a language is a possibility. I did my master's at SOAS and I, I did a language um, and, I, and I benefited tremendously from doing that. Um, Okay, uh, something from Elisa on the actual things that I was talking about, asking whether uh, humanitarian organisations work in a logic of charity and they create relationships of dependence instead of empowering populations to improve their situations. Yeah, good point, Elisa. And I think that is one of the, the strong critiques of humanitarian sectors. Um, uh, not that they necessarily do that deliberately, but that may be one of the inadvertent consequences um, of the way that they act uh, and their approaches um, that they take. Um, uh, and I suppose I was th that's really what I meant when I was talking about the, the idea of white saviorism. Uh, and there is that profound narrative. Um, again, it can be quite difficult for humanity. I mean, no one is pretending that it's easy for them. Um, so there can be a degree of sympathy. Um, and one of the, because the, the principle of neutrality means no engagement in politics, there are those that say, as soon as you engage in reconstruction and rebuilding, that actually becomes political because it moves into the territory of development and de because development is political, therefore that means that humanitarian organizations shouldn't be engaged in that. They should simply be about, you know, the sticking plaster at a mo at a time of need. Um, personally, but this is a personal view, I'm not entirely convinced by that. I think the idea that humanitarian emergencies are not political or can be engaged in without uh, politics coming into it is, is a nonsense. Um, and I, th I think it's a myth that's convenient, um, but it does create some of these, these problems around that. Um, okay. Okay, so a good question from Veronica asking about whether we take experience into account when people are applying, particularly if they don't quite meet the academic um, grades that we're asking for. Absolutely. It's really important to us that, you know, we look at the full application, the full person. So if you kind of meet our criteria, then that's, an, you know, that, that's fine. You just send that in um, and that's, uh, you know, it, it's a very easy decision. But if you know that you don't, what we then are looking for is, you know, why is it that you want to take a program and why, what gives us, what can give us confidence that you will do well in this program? You know, we want people to take it and we want people to pass. Um, so is there anything else that you can tell us about yourself and your past that might give us that confidence, even if you haven't got the academic grades that we might, not, we might normally ask for? So make sure you put that in your personal statement. Make sure you, you explain why you think this course is appropriate for you and you are appropriate for our programs. We have in the past taken people who haven't even got a first degree, um, never mind the grade they get from the first degree, because they've had really good experience of working in a day-to-day -day environment in development. So do make sure you do that. Don't assume that we won't make you an offer, get in touch. And if you want, you can always get in touch with the admissions officer informally before you put in your application, just to have a chat with them to see whether they think it's worth you applying. Um, and if you do apply, just make sure in your personal statement that you make all of your experience really clear so we have the information that we need to make a decision so anyone else who's in that situation you know please do bear that in mind don't assume uh, that you won't get an offer try us let us know tell us about yourself uh, and then we'll see um Amira is asking whether there are examples where anthropological factors of beneficiaries are taken into account by humanitarian actors 
I don't quite understand the question. I'm sorry, um, but I, I get. I think you're probably asking about whether humanitarian actors are engaging um, with. Uh, kind of culture, the, the, the local cultures uh, and local traditions. Uh, yes, that's certainly true. Humanitarian agencies have certainly got a lot better at that. Um, not always perfectly, sometimes it's learning. Uh, if you're interested in that, there's some really interesting things about the response to Ebola uh, from you know a few years ago where uh, the more successful interventions were those that worked with cultural expectations and cultural behaviors rather than simply trying to ban them. Um, something, of course, that's been really important over the past year in relation to COVID. Uh, and also thinking about, um, you know, for example, after the tsunami uh, in Muslim countries, many women wanted the humanitarian agencies to provide them with headscarves so they would feel comfortable going out into public spaces. And at first, many humanitarian agencies were reluctant to do that because it didn't seem to fit within their uh, expectations of what humanitarian aid looked like, um, but gradually they they understood that actually this was really important. Um, so, you know, if that's the question you're asking, yeah, there are some quite good examples of that. It's not perfect. There are always examples of bad practice, but there is a, a recognition, um, I think, amongst humanitarian actors that this is really important for effective uh, and, and sustainable and lasting responses. Um, have I still got time? Though? I'm aware that I'm over time. Can I carry on going? Um, yeah, we've got about five minutes. Okay, so I'll, I'll try and get through. I, I, I may not get through them all, but as I say, you've got my email address. I'm very happy to carry this, carry on these conversations. Similarly, if I haven't fully answered your question, uh, get in touch and let me know. Um, okay, so Andrea talking about the media's role um, and how can we, good question, how can we portray suffering uh, um, um, place in places in need of aid in a dignified way you know that's, that's a it's a really difficult question um, and you can clearly see um, differences um, you know if you go back to the way that missionaries in the late 19th century were presenting um, uh, suffering in in Africa uh, and elsewhere um, there is a, developed a language of, of what we expect um, and this really carries on until the 1980s. In the 1990s, many NGOs started to understand that the imagery was deeply problematic uh, and started to try and make amends uh, and to do things in more interesting ways. Now, I think, I think we're all aware that it's not been entirely successful. Um, in development, perhaps it's been slightly easier, but in emergencies, there are still the people still resort to the kind of the, the classic cliches of of the suffering child, and there's an extent to which those things are of course true, but it does give a one sided picture. It does give a it does and, and perpetuate narratives and, and kind of the orientalism of looking at at suffering in the global south. And I think the problem is that also then contributes to the, the the kind of glorification of the global north as the uh, place that comes in and saves the rest of the world. So yeah, it's, it's deeply problematic. NGOs are trying to grapple with this, um, as are others, um, but I'm not sure. Some are more successful than others, um, but it does remain problematic. And I think also news reports um, also perhaps need to give more thought about this. Some news outlets are better than others and balance out kind of the images of suffering with, you know, stories of, of other things that are going on. You know, just as an, one example, perhaps, you know, we've been talking a lot about what the Global North, how the Global North can respond better in relation to COVID, uh, in supporting COVID in the Global South. What we're hearing a lot less of is how the Global North can learn from the Global South. You know, some of the things that have been done in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, have been far ahead of what's been going on in the UK and much of Europe, North America. Uh, in Senegal, they had a track and trace system far before we did, you know, a working one, far before we had a similar app uh, in the UK. Rwanda has been making use of drones, of robots. In South Africa, they've been making extensive use of chatbots to ask, answer people's questions. All of the kind of things that, you know, we haven't really been doing uh, in the global north. Um, so it's, it's, it's not just about the way that they're represented, perhaps, but it's also about the way we engage with people across different regions and do so in ways that recognize their own expertise, their own powers, their own successes. Um, arguably something we, well, we haven't, certainly haven't done in COVID. Um, yeah, so, uh, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm really not going to be able to pronounce this properly, but I'll give it a go. Is it Snigda or Snigda um, has asked about, um, the, is there a way for humanitarian organisations to work without negotiating with local power forces? 
Yeah, it's, you know, that's a really difficult question. I, I can only suggest that you take the humanitarian module because that will answer it far better. And it will probably take a whole module, if not a whole program to answer that than I can. It is really difficult um, because these situations are so complex. Um, so I think it's very rare that organizations can go in without any kind of negotiation. Um, uh, and then they try and keep as much distance as they can. I think equally problematic, and this is, for example, in Afghanistan, where um, NGO, some NGOs have been working alongside the foreign military as part of the global alliance, uh, the global alliance forces that have been operating there. Um, and that is really worrying. Um, you know, so when you have like Save the Children Australia who have been not quite embedded in the Australian army, but working alongside them and are therefore seen to be um, participating or willing participants in the, um, uh, the foreign occupation. So on the one hand, they would argue, but we have no other way of, meet, of, of reaching those people in those remotest of remote villages. But on the other hand, they are, perhaps they are supporting a deeply problematic conflict, and they are supporting a particular side in doing so. Um, so there may well be ways. I think it's incredibly difficult, um, uh, so, which is my way of just saying it's very complicated, uh, and I'm not sure. It took me a long time to get that. Does the uh, so someone's asking about the, whether the course provides practical experience? So we do have uh, modules where we teach you practical tools. Uh, we, you know, there are, so. I, um, uh, development practice, uh, where you learn about the tools and the techniques that are used in uh, global development by global development organizations or humanitarian organizations. Um, for people doing the dissertations, there is absolutely no requirement to do field work because many of our students simply can't. Um, however, that said, many of our students do do some kind of field work, and of course, that can give them practical experience, particularly in research. And then, of course, many of our students are also undertaking internships or volunteering um, for uh, relevant organizations. So that gives you those kind of experiences as well. So I guess it's a combination of all of those kind of things. Um, OK, so a question from Nadine. I think this is probably the last question I'm going to be able to ask. So, um, you know, anyone else, please do get in touch with me um, separately. Um, so this is asking about the um, the online program, the MSc humanitarian online programs and the humanitarianism aid and conflict uh, program. So I know this year has been a bit strange. So effectively, all of our teaching has been online. Um, but obviously, uh, as with everyone, we're hoping things go back to um, more normal from September. So we do have uh, online programs which are only taught online. Um, and we have our on-campus programs. Um, so they have slightly different um, uh, um, structures um, they have uh, you know they, they cover many of the, uh, many of the same areas in terms of the uh, the curriculum but uh, not entirely the same so it, it, it's not that they're exactly the same program but they're designed you know some people don't want to come to SARS and will want to learn at a distance and some will want to come it's not quite that simple um, so I think it's the, the best thing there to do is to look at the structure and see which of the programs best suits you if and, and many people, especially if they're working um, uh, full time, they may not actually be able to come uh, and study. In those cases, our online programs, either in humanitarianism or in international aid uh, or in environment. If you look at CEDEP, C-E-D-E-P, it's part of the uh, department. They offer pro online distance learning programs and environment. They're a really good um, uh, option for those people who can't, for whatever reason, come to SOAS. Um, you know, they're really good degrees. Um, they are slightly different, um, but they are sort of equally good in terms of the quality uh, and in terms of their reputation. So it's, it's worth having a look, but as with all things, have a look at the structure to see and, and the way that it works just to see which one works best for you. Um, it's much easier, for example, if you're doing a full-time job to do an online degree rather than to do a part-time on-campus degree, um, just because the amount of time that you need to spend learning makes it difficult, if not impossible, to combine with a full-time job, but the online programs are designed for those who are working full time um, uh, so they, they, they can be, be able to complete them. So I hope uh, I get in touch with the convener of the distance program and the campus program uh, if you have any specific questions and they'll be able to explain it in much more detail. 
So look, thanks everyone for your comments. I know I've not been able to answer them all. Please do get in touch if you have any questions, either about the things I've talked about today or about any of our programs. Um, you don't have to get in touch with me directly. You can get in touch with the conveners of the uh, of the program to which you've applied or the conveners of modules, or you can just get in touch with me. And if I can't answer the question, I'll know who to pass it on to. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it useful. Uh, I hope it gave you a flavour of, of how we teach at SOAS uh, and how we engage with issues and, and how we think about that kind of critical questioning, but positive, I hope, analysis. And I really look forward to seeing you all uh, in late September, October for the start of the next academic year. Thanks, everyone. Bye.